Hey guys, welcome to Telling the Told and Untold. My name is Tsuru. Before we go straight into today's case, I do have to give you guys a content warning. In this video, we do talk about suicide. I don't go into any detail, but still, if that's not something you think you're interested in watching, then this video probably isn't for you, so maybe you can watch some of my other videos or just wait for my next upload. For today's case, we're going all the way back to 2005 when Dr. Anwar Kadwa was a 50-year-old prominent plastic surgeon that worked at Nedcare Park Lane and he was married to 49-year-old Munira Kadwa. They had two children, 23-year-old Riaz and 18-year-old Nabila. Riaz was in university and Nabila was in matric, which is grade 12. And by all accounts, the Kadwas seemed like a very well-respected family, especially in their tight-knit Muslim Indian community in Crown North where they lived. Munira was described as someone who was very well organized, she was kind, she was caring, she loved people but more especially her family, she loved her husband and her two children and Dr. Kadra was described as someone that everyone could look up to. Their son Riaz was born in February 1983 and just like his father he was a highly intelligent man. When he was still in high school, he had memorized the entire Quran and this led him to have the name Haviz, which is just an Arabic word for someone who memorizes and recites the entire Quran, which is over 600 pages. He wasn't much of an academic though, he did matriculate and he went on to university to study science but after his first year he decided not to return. He then enrolled at another university and again he didn't finish his studies and then he went on to another university and again he didn't finish his studies and he had dropped out. Despite him not being that diligent in academics, he was interested in other things. He was a skilled Eastern martial arts person. He was second done and he had provided weapons training and also received weapons training. Once he had earned his driver's license, his father had bought him four cars in just four years. That's basically like a car every single year. The Kadras were also a very typical Muslim family, so despite Riaz not being that diligent in his academics, he was very diligent in his religious studies and he also led classes at the mosque and he was someone that people in the religious community looked up to that like that they could speak to. So his parents were very proud of him for being able to do these things. And because the Kadwas were like a typical Muslim family, they did have a hierarchy in their household as do many other households. And their father, Dr. Kadwa, was at the top of this hierarchy, followed by Riaz because he was the firstborn son, the only son. So he was number two and then it was followed by Munira and then Nabila. The tragic events of today's case took place in October 2005 and the beginning of October is the beginning of Ramadan. And if you don't know, Ramadan is the ninth month of the Islamic calendar and it's a holy month of fasting for the Muslim community to celebrate the revelation of the Quran and it's a time where Muslims from dusk to dawn don't eat or drink anything and they're also not allowed to smoke. It's a very holy time where, you know, they just focus on family family and their religion which is why when this case happened at like during such a holy time it shook the entire community and no one could believe it. On the 6th of October everyone was preparing for Ramadan and on this particular day Dr. Kadwa was at his private practice at Park Lane and on this day he had spent most of his day in theatre where he had an initiative where he would give free surgeries to children from disadvantaged communities who were born with cleft palates. After he was done for the day he returned home and everyone was home, his wife Manira, his daughter Nabila, his son Riaz and his son's wife whose name was also Nabila but they were spelled differently. According to daughter Nabila that night they sat together as a family, they had dinner and dinner ended just at around like 7 p.m. and then afterwards Dr. Kadra went to go watch TV and the two women remained in the kitchen just to clean up and then not too long after that Riaz then went for left for mosque and then Nabila went upstairs to her room so that she could study. It was the beginning of October, very close to 
exam time and you know she's in a trick it's a very important time in her schooling career you know it's like make or break so she was studying and then at about half past nine she heard Ria's come back from mosque and she shouted out to her mom just to let her know that Ria's was back and then she went downstairs and she sat down with her father and the two of them just had a little conversation they drank tea together and then at around half past 10 Munira said her Good night to the whole family. She went up to bed and not too long after that, mostly everyone went back to their rooms and they had retired for the night. An hour after Manira had said good night, community members heard gunshots coming from the Kadwa family home. One of the first people to react to the gunshots was Salim Toka, who was a resident in the same street as the Kadwas, as well as the chairperson of the Johannesburg Central Community Police Forum. He had heard gunshots coming from the Kadwas just after 11.30 that night, and he had also heard someone screaming for help coming from the top window of the Kadwa home. He immediately ran to the Kadwa's house along with other neighbors, and the first thing that they noticed was that the front door was wide open and it was completely dark inside. Not too long after that, police officers arrived on the scene, followed by forensics, so that they could also just look at the house, look at the bodies, and just try and find any evidence about what had happened. It turned out that Dr. Kadwa, alongside his wife Munira, had been shot and killed. At 7.30 the next morning, so just about eight hours after the murders had taken place, their bodies were taken away so that an autopsy could be quickly done and their body and that the two of them could be buried before sundown in accordance with Muslim tradition. Hundreds of relatives, friends and residents surrounded the Kadwa family home and they were shocked and surprised. They couldn't believe that Dr. Kadwa and his wife Munira had been killed. They didn't understand how something like that could happen in their community and everyone was just confused, hurt and just wanted to understand what had happened. One of the investigating officers had arrived at the Kadwa home between 1 in the morning and 1.30, so about an hour and a half or two hours after the Kadwas had been murdered. And as soon as he walked into the house, he noticed that there was a gun and its magazine on the floor, just by like the foot of the stairs. And then he climbed up the stairs and halfway there, he noticed that there was a knife. He then proceeded to the main bedroom where Dr. Kadwa and his wife slept. And once he walked in, he saw that Dr. Kadwa was lying on the bed and he was filled with bullet wounds and his body was covered with a tray but like half of his body not his entire body he then walked to the bathroom and this is where he saw Munira lying on her back facing the ceiling and she had been shot in the face there was a blood on the floor that led from the bed to the bedroom and the investigating officer also saw bullet casings all over the bedroom floor and also at the entrance of the bedroom where the mirror connected to it. He was informed that they believed that it was an armed robbery and they didn't notice anything missing at the time but they also at the time they didn't know what to look for to know if anything had been stolen or missing from the home and then he decided to go talk to the witnesses. The witnesses were Riaz, Nabila his sister and Nabila his wife. According to Riaz, two intruders had broken into their home, switched off the electricity and then went to his parents' room and killed them. He says that at the time of the murders, his sister was in her bedroom, his wife was in the shower and he was downstairs getting his wife a glass of water when the electricity was, like, the electricity suddenly switched off. This was before, like, load shedding times. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so he was getting a glass of water and then the lights went off and then he heard like his mother screaming or something like that and then he shouted at his sister to get into the cupboard and also his wife Nabila to get into the cupboard. He then grabbed a knife from the kitchen and he walked up the stairs and straight into his parents bedroom. He says once he got to his parents bedroom he heard the intruders speaking Afrikaans to one another and then he jumped on one of the intruders backs and they got like into a little scuffle and the intruder like pushed him against the door and there was a mirror close to the door and that's how how he cut his forehead and the investigating officer did look at Riaz and noticed that he did have a cut on his forehead. Riaz says that whilst he was on the intruder's back the intruder decided to like throw him onto the floor judo style like you know like how you see on movies like when they like 
like throw it from the shoulder like down to the floor he says that's what the intruder did and then he realized that he wasn't going to be able to overpower this intruder so he just decided to run back to his bedroom and call for help Nabila at this point was Nabila's daughter. Uh, she was in her room in the cupboard and she had also called several people um, asking them for help. From a close analysis of the scene, it was clear that all the shots had been directed to Dr. Anwar. They picked up 14 cartridges on the scene and it was clear that the shooter must have reloaded because a magazine only takes 11 to 12 bullets. It was also clear that the shooter, as they were shooting towards Dr. Anwar, they were holding a flashlight just because they found a flashlight lying on the floor. So they had switched off the electricity from the main box and then the intruder had was holding a flashlight but then also holding a gun. Hope that makes sense. One of the bullets that was directed at Dr. Anwar was fired too high and ended up in Munira's abdomen and turns out after Munira had been shot, she tried to reach for the bedside lamp but she wasn't able to switch on the lamp and it fell down to the floor and then she started crawling trying to get to the main switch which was right next to the door to their bedroom and they could tell that she did this by the like blood drops from her side of the bedroom to the main switch and turned out that she also tried to switch on the main switch because they could see like her handprint or like blood smears on the light switch but because they had turned off the electricity from the main switch the light still didn't switch on and it said that by the time she got there and she realized what was happening she must have seen the intruder because the intruder was standing right there and then she tried to run into the bathroom and then the intruder ran after her and they fired one shot but this shot missed her and it just hit the back of the wall just behind her and then they fired a second shot and they shot her in the face. So basically from their crime analysis looking at the blood splatter, looking at the bullets and just everything like that, they could tell that there was a third person in the room and that it wasn't Dr. Anwar that had killed Munira or Munira that had killed Dr. Kadwa. There had to have been a third person in the room. Also, the intruder story that Riaz had relayed sounded suspicious to the investigating officers, but at that stage they couldn't discount it because they hadn't done all like their evidence and investigating of like the crime scene if that makes sense then about eight days after dr kadwa and his wife munira had been killed on the 15th of october ria presented an affidavit to the police changing his original account of what took place that night the events leading to Riaz changing his story were interesting to say the least. So police officers, once they started investigating the house and just looking at the crime scene, they realized that there wasn't any intruders that had walked into the house. And they believed that there was no intruders because they didn't find any forced entry, nothing had been stolen. And this house, there was like a safe, the safe had Krugerrands, there were paintings that were worth a lot of money. There was just a lot of things that these intruders could have taken if it was an armed robbery, but they hadn't taken anything. The only evidence they really found at the crime scene was a fingerprint on the firearm and this fingerprint belonged to Riaz. Also, Ria said that at the time when the intruders broke into the house, his wife Nabila was in the shower. So police officers went to the shower just to go see where she had been at the time and the shower was completely dry and the bar of soap was also dry, meaning that Nabila hadn't been in the shower when the intruders had supposedly broken in. So why would Ria's and Nabila say that? So once police officers all agreed on the fact that there wasn't an intruder and that there was no indication that there was someone else in the house besides the five people that were in the house on that day, which were Dr. Kadwa, his wife Manira, Riaz, daughter Nabila, and wife Nabila. They then decided to call Riaz into the police station. So they called Riaz in, they basically sat him down, and they told him that they didn't believe his story about there being an intruder or intruders. So they basically told him what they thought. They told Riaz that they thought that Dr. Kadwa had shot his wife Manira, and then Riaz had ran up to the room and started fighting with his father and in self-defense had killed his father. 
But the thing is, they didn't actually believe that was the story. They thought that Rias had something to do with it, but they just wanted to see how he was going to react. And Rias did exactly what they thought he would do. He called a family meeting and then he told them that his father had killed his mother and then he had killed his father in self-defense. He was literally just telling them the same story that police officers had told him because that's what he thought police officers thought what happened, thought that that's what happened. Does that make sense? And just like that, Riaz Kadra became their prime suspect. Yusuf Desai, Munira's brother and Dr. Kadra's brother-in-law, says that on the 6th of October at around half past one, I mean half past twelve that night, he received a phone call from his niece, Nabila, saying that she was hiding in the cupboard and that her mother and father had been killed. Immediately, he got into a car with his family and they drove down to Joburg. I'm not too sure where they were coming from, but they didn't live in Joburg. So they drove down to Joburg and immediately he went to his mother's house and then the next morning Riaz arrived at the house and Yusuf just gave him a big hug and told him that he was sorry and told Riaz that he had to be strong. Then the next morning Riaz, his uncle Yusuf and Yusuf's wife, they went to the Kadwa's house and once they got there Riaz said that he had to go into the house so he went into the house alone and Yusuf stayed back with his wife and they were just at the gates and then whilst they were just there waiting Yusuf heard Riaz screaming but it wasn't just like a scream like maybe it just was something that like scared him like it was like frightening like something had happened and immediately Yusuf took out his gun and he ran into the house ran up the stairs into the main bedroom and he saw Riaz looking at a mirror and in this mirror there was a question mark that had been drawn with lipstick and he was very confused and didn't understand why there was a question mark there and Riaz basically just said to his uncle that he thinks that the intruders had returned and they had drawn this question mark on the mirror just to let them know like you know like I had done this or like I had gotten away with it or just something like that. Later Riaz told his uncle that he was the one that had drawn the question mark with lipstick and he gave two reasons as to why he did this. The first thing he said was that he was trying to remove any blame from his family and the second thing or like why he had drawn this question mark on the mirror was because he was basically just asking Allah why he had taken his family away like that, or why he had broken up their family. Yusuf was very confused by the statement and also the entire family too. And not too long after that, Rias called a family meeting. And during this family meeting, he told his family that he had to tell them the truth about what had actually happened that night. He told them that that night he had heard his mother screaming. So he ran up to his parents' bedroom and then he saw his father holding a gun in one hand and a knife in another hand. and looking at his mother saying I killed the bitch and then he started fighting with his father like fighting over the gun and then the gun fell to the floor and then somehow he managed to push his father on the bed but this was before his father pushed him against the mirror um, and that's how he scratched like his forehead and then he managed to pick up the gun from the floor and then he started shooting at his father like shot his father multiple times and then the gun ran out of bullets and then he reloaded the gun and started shooting his father again. As his family was listening to the story, no one believed what Riaz was saying. They didn't believe that Dr. Kadra was capable of murdering his wife. And they were just very confused and they didn't know what to believe. And Yusuf also knew that his brother-in-law was totally incompetent when it came to a gun. Like he didn't know how to use it and everyone was just more confused than they were before. Then a few days after he had told his family that his father had killed his mother and then he had killed his father in self-defense, he called another family meeting and he told them a third story. And then this third story, he told them that what had actually happened was that his mother had killed his father and then she had killed herself. So it was basically a murder-suicide. And this was also the same story that he had told police officers in the presence of his lawyer. So in just a couple of days, Riaz had told both his family and police officers three different stories about what had happened the night that his parents were killed. 
Then the following year, about six months later, on 30th of March 2006, Riaz, his sister Nabila, and his wife, also Nabila, handed themselves over to police. This was on the advice of their attorney who felt as though the final version about what had happened that night was the truth and that it would stand up in court. The three of them were then taken straight to the Johannesburg Magistrates Court and one of the police spokespersons made an announcement and he said that the male suspect would be charged with two counts of murder and defeating the ends of justice while the two women would be charged with murder after the fact and defeating the ends of justice. During his bill application, Ria said that his parents were very unhappy in their marriage and that they were destined for divorce. And he also said, and I quote, My father was having an affair with another woman and wished to leave home. My mother confronted my father on the evening of Wednesday, the 6th of October 2005, and shot him a number of times. Thereafter, my mother shot and killed herself. When asked why he had initially lied to police officers, Ria said that he had done so because he knew that his mother's suicide would be deeply offensive to the Muslim community. Nabila, both Nabilas actually were granted bail and their bail was set at 8,000 Rand and then the following day Riaz's bail was set at 20,000 Rand. A year after Dr. Anwar and Munira were found dead in their room, the murder trial was said to begin. Riaz and both Nabilas pleaded not guilty. Nabila and Nabila had told the investigating officers the same story that Riaz had relayed about the intruders, but during their cross examinations, they told them they told the court that they didn't really know what happened that night, but they were just telling the story that Riaz had told them to tell police officers. The advocate put it to the court that Riaz Kadwa had fatally shot his father and then went to the bathroom and killed his mother. An autopsy revealed that Munira's jaw had been broken and it's very hard to break someone's jaw so they believe that as Munira ran into the bathroom she fell onto the floor and she broke her jaw. Also they didn't find any like evidence that she had been hit or something like that to have caused her jaw to be broken so they do believe she fell in the bathroom and then she broke her jaw. Ria says that when he got into the bedroom, his mother was barely dressed. She was just in a nightdress and she told her son that she had been shot. Ria then went to the cupboard so that he could give her so that he could get a nightgown for his mother and then give his mother a nightgown so that she could cover herself. And he says as he was giving his mother the nightgown, the nightgown was like draped over his arm but he was still holding the gun that his mother had just used to shoot his father. And as he was giving his mother this nightgown, she grabbed the gun instead and then shot herself. Evidence indicated that Dr. Kadwa had been alive for at least 15 minutes after he had been shot eight times. And also the phone was off, the, like the house phone was off the hook and there was also a cell phone found on the floor in the Kadwa's bedroom. Which means, if what Riaz is saying is true, that once he got into the bedroom, he saw his father lying in the bed. His father was still alive and breathing. But he was just focused on his mother being in a night dress and like not being dressed appropriate appropriately and instead of calling for help and trying to help his father and just make sure that his mother doesn't do anything else, he went to go get a gown just to make sure that his mother is covered up. An experienced ballistics expert was also called in and they said that Munira had been shot at least 30 centimeters away from her face and they could tell this because after she had been shot there was like tattooing left on her face from like the gunpowder from the gun and she had been shot like by her nose so like like just under her nose like she had been shot here and 30 centimeters away and that's a very awkward angle for you to like shoot yourself also most people don't kill themselves like in that angle like in that place where she had been shot also most people who try to end their lives don't shoot themselves twice not like not that it's impossible it's just highly unlikely that she had shot herself. The advocate also submitted Munira's personal diaries. They found two of her diaries and her diaries indicated that she wasn't in a very happy marriage. 
relatives say that the Kadwa seemed like a very happy family and they really did like to the outside world they tried to show that they were this perfect family but they were anything but it turned out that Dr. Kadwa had been having extramarital affairs and Munir thought that he had taken a second wife. Marrying another woman is acceptable in the Muslim Sharia law or Sharia law. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that properly. Men are allowed to marry a second wife, just like you know, like Zulu tradition, like it's tailed. But I'm assuming like at least you must tell your wife what you're doing. Like you don't do it in secret. You know, it's not something that should be hidden. But he hit this and yeah, he had also threatened to leave the family. He told them that at the end of Nabila's school year, he was moving out and he was basically just done with the family. And this had happened in October. So if this was true, he was going to leave the family in the next month or the next two months. Now I'm going to read you some of Munira's diary entries. She has started writing in these diaries about five years before, so about 2000. So some of them are from like the early 2000s up until like 2005, probably just like three of them. And I'm going to read them as is, so it might not make sense. I'll try and make it make sense, but yeah, I'm just reading it as is. So on the 20th of April 2000, she wrote, Wants to go away for a few days. Mustn't ask where or with who. I said Nabila going out to G Reef next day, which I'm assuming is Gold Reef next day. Said I'm using children as pawns. For God's sake, I said wants to leave for another wife. She also wrote that sometimes Dr. Kadwa would come home late and he would just get into bed and not say where he had been. She had also found four strands of blonde hair and also lipstick on his white shirt. On the 1st of June 2001, she wrote A, which probably means Anwa, spoke to me again. Same story, wants to go. I'm rude, etc. This time insulted me even more, saying someone, sometimes he's living with a man. I spoke my mind a bit. Another time she wrote, said he hates me. That really shook me. Called Riaz. This child is traumatized. Nabila cried. I'll help us. I don't know if she's saying all help us or Allah help us, but yeah. And then in another entry, she indicated that her husband said that he had made up his mind and he was going to leave her. And then one evening, they had such a huge confrontation that she had slept in Nabila's room and Riaz was devastated. One of the recent diary entries before she and her husband were killed was on the 28th of June 2005 and she wrote, came to bed 10.30 in the evening, confronted him, listened until part where I said I saw them hugging and kissing, all hell broke loose, called me a fucking liar over and over again, Shada and Zari bitches, never wants to see them again, they are checking him by calling rooms, who is lying and who is really the bitch called me an animal and then she also wrote at first said he feels like killing me wants to take a knife out of a drawer to kill me hates me he swore and behaved like a mad animal i'm not too sure who shada and sorry are i'm just assuming they might have been people that dr kadwa had been having extramarital affairs with but those are basically the diary entries it also turned out that Munira had had a private investigator and she would look at Dr. Kadwa's car mileage so before he would go to work and after he'd come home from work because she also knew how far his work was from home so she would be able to calculate like the distances and if he had went somewhere else that wasn't work. Munira's sister also took the stand and she told the court that the couple had been having problems in their marriage and these problems had started about four years earlier and often at times Dr. Kadwa would move in and out of the house so sometimes he would just say like he's leaving the house he'd move out for maybe a couple of days months weeks I'm not too sure and then he'd move back in and would just be like kind of like a back and forth. Munira's sister also went on to tell the courts that her sister didn't know how to use a firearm and she didn't believe this narrative that Riaz was trying to make the courts believe that her sister was involved in a murder-suicide. She also said that uh, her sister had told her should anything ever happen to her that she should get rid of the diaries. Munira didn't want people knowing about her diaries, what she had written, what had been happening in her family, maybe still trying to keep up like this perfect 
family image but after Munira and Dr. Kadwa had died and Munira's sister had asked Riaz for the diaries he told her that they had went missing he didn't know where they were but they did turn up in court so obviously Riaz was lying about that Finally, on the 25th of July 2007, Riaz Kadwa was found guilty of murdering his father and mother, Dr. Anwar and Munira Kadwa, and was sentenced to 22 years imprisonment. He should be released in 2029, which is just in a couple of years. His sister Nabila Kadwa was found guilty of attempting to defeat the ends of justice by agreeing with his false intruder claims and was given a 12-month suspended sentence. His wife, Nabila Kadwa, was found not guilty on the charge of defeating the ends of justice as there was not enough evidence to convict her of anything. Some people believe that Riaz killed his parents because he was just so tired of them fighting. He didn't want them to get a divorce and also because his father had said that he was going to leave the family at the end of the school year, which was just in a month or two. And he was scared that he wouldn't be able to have the lifestyle that he had always had. At the time of the murders, Riaz was not working and his wife was still in university. So he was fully dependent on both of his parents. Also, according to Muslim Sharia law or Sharia law, I'm so sorry if I'm not pronouncing that correctly, but if a father does die, then the mother inherits about an eighth of the husband's estate and then the son would receive double of what the daughter would get. So at the times of the murders, Dr. Anwar Kadwa's estate was worth about 12 million rand and Munir's estate was worth 2 million rand. Um, so the two children would have inherited a lot of money they would have become so wealthy but fortunately the two of them did not receive anything because if you are convicted of murder then according to muslim tradition if i'm not mistaken then you can't inherit anything so riaz and his sister nabila did not get anything And yeah, that's it for today's case. Please let me know what you guys think. Please let me know if you guys think Riaz did it or you believe one of his three stories. His lawyer does believe that he that he is innocent and he was wrongly convicted please let me know what you think i'm so interested to hear all your thoughts and opinions please don't forget to leave a like a comment and please do subscribe it does mean so much to me and it really helps a lot and yeah thank you guys so, so much for watching and i'll see you guys next time bye